Okay, it's time to get the show on the road. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here and thank everybody for coming down today. I'd like to recognize some people coming down from Brigham Young University and also some people from UTC at Provo. I'd like to thank them for making the trip. Well, this is one of the activities the AIDD plans throughout the year. And I guess it originated when one of our advisors went back to the national conference last year. Now, since Carl Seaman, our advisor, did the inviting and everything, I think it's only fair that he should be the one to introduce our speaker today. So if I could get Carl Seaman up here to start the program off. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, appreciate it. Doug Jorgensen, you want to stand up and let everybody know who you are and where you're at? This is the fellow from UTEC Provo, the instructor, and then he's got a, have you got your, uh, what, about five or six students with you, right? Sounds good. And then uh, Max Razor from uh, BYU, stand up each at a time. And is it Wilford Tolman, also from BYU. They're the uh, instructors, advisors at BYU and uh, I'd also like to thank those two individuals for bringing these shields that they've brought down from BYU. Their chapter has been oriented and implemented uh, years back, five, somewhere around that, or is it longer than that? The first student chapter in the nation, or in this area. Uh -huh. But as you can see, they've been well oriented and, and have got a head start on our particular chapter because they've got the shields, the flags, the and the time I went down to visit them, they even had uh, jackets for the students, uh, student chapters. So they've got a they've got a chapter to look up to and to compete with. And so we might look forward to that kind of competition. Uh, Weber State indicated that they might come. Is anybody here from Weber State? Nobody. I think they're probably going to show up to the evening session tonight. Mr. Waltrip, I've since he's here from. Iowa, I've taken advantage and I'm going to work him to death today. We've got him uh, set up for this 10 a.m. session. He's then going to go immediately to BYU for a 2 o'clock uh, presentation to their chapter in, in BYU. And then he's got to be back here at 8 o'clock for a professional chapter uh, presentation. We're trying to start and orient a Salt Lake professional chapter. So you might look forward to that, and as you're planning in the future as, as students and then graduates, you might think about getting into and joining this professional chapter of AIDD to keep oriented in what's happening in, in the field of drafting in and around Utah. At our national convention last year when I went to their session for about a week in April, I met Warren again. and. Uh, Mr. Walt White, our department head, at that, prior to that, had asked me, why don't you try to invite some speakers out to our college, because we haven't had a whole lot representing the drafting department in as far as lecturing. And to my great surprise, he accepted at that time. Mr. Waltrip is a, a drafting supervisor, a, a, an engineer at a large company in, in Iowa called Clinton Corn Processing. And by large company, I mean multi-million dollar company. Uh, they deal in, well, he can give you some, sta I'm starting to steal some of his thunder, but uh, uh, we're happy to have him here and we're proud to see that, uh, that AIDD is interested in us as a student chapter. And so with that, uh, Warren, thank you. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you, Carl. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. It's a beautiful facilities that you have here. The weather's great. Uh, hope to get out and maybe get out in the sunshine a little bit sometime today between here and there. Um, I guess Carl does have me uh, scheduled pretty tightly, but that's okay. That's what I'm here for, is to serve you. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to clarify a little bit something about what Carl said. 
about me. Um, I am a drafting supervisor. My training is um, two years of architectural design and this sort of thing. I'm not an engineer, but uh, and I'm not trying to pound my own drum or anything else, but my company has accepted me and uh, made me a project engineer. So you see, there are ways to go on if you put your best foot forward and do every effort that you're capable of doing, you can continue to grow in your companies. So keep that in mind at all times. It's up to you how far you can go. Now, let me get into what I prepared. Let's see if I can move that. Just Can everybody hear me way back in the corners? That's the best place to set way back in the corner. Um, I accepted Carl's... Uh, invitation to be here with you today to talk about the programs and the responsibilities and the activities of the American Institute of Design and Drafting and also your future functions as a draftsman or a designer. Uh, on the other side of the fence, out there in the world of reality. I mean you've got to stay here for two years and it's all it's all good and, and uh, this sort of thing but um, what you do here is nothing like what it's out there. It's a cold, hard, cruel world. It's dog eat dog, and it's the best ones that do put every effort that they're capable of doing are the ones that are going to make the grade. I have to put it that way because that's the way it is. If you don't realize that, then you're missing the ball game. Um, just a bit of the personal history of myself. Like I said, I come from a background of educational training in architectural and civil design, and I think you have kind of a thing going here between your mechanical and your architectural classes, so I'm not going to take sides. Uh, but mostly, I come from the school of hard knocks. Uh, I have the um, patches back here to show it. Uh, I work for Clinton Corn Processing at Clinton, Iowa. And we are the manufacturers of commercial corn sugars and syrups for the food industry and corn starches for the paper and the textile industry. We consume a raw product, 120,000 bushels of corn a day, 365 days a year. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you. You don't grow corn out here, do you? Do you? Okay. That's a, if you look at a yield of 100 bushels of corn an acre, now I don't know if you get that kind of yields out in this area here, but we do back there, that's 120, 000, or 100, or 1,200 acres a day of corn. Uh, that's 40, uh, 35 to 40 carloads of shelled corn that we put into our plant each day. We have an automatic uh, unloader, a guy sets up in a control room, picks up a, a box car and tips it, and tips it up 45 degrees and 45 degrees and no human hands ever touch it. It's all unloaded. It takes us about seven minutes to unload a, cor a, call, a car of corn. All the words that start with C make me stumble and I work for Clinton Corn Processing. <laughs> um, our main plant at Clinton employs 1,500 employees and we will soon go into production at our new Montezuma plant, Montezuma, New York, and they will grind approximately 40 to 50,000 bushels of corn a day. So you can see that we create a good market uh, for a farm product. And um, one other thing about that, too, you know, we talk about the energy, our dependency on imports and this sort of thing. And our well, let's look at the uh, our dependency on sugar imports, cane sugar, and we do raise quite a bit of beet sugar, but we supply sugars to the uh, soft drink industry, um, to the rolls, the bakery goods, this sort of thing, thereby decreasing our dependency on importing or of um, of sugars from out of the state and help with the uh, trade balances as far as the United States is concerned. And um, we happen to have developed a corn sugar uh, that is sweeter than cane or beet sugar and at a lower cost. 
So it puts us in a very favorable market uh, with our competitors, and uh, we are licensing uh, other uh, corn uh, milling industries, our manufacturers, along with ourselves to produce the same product. So we look for a great, great future in this over the next five and ten years um, that will, you know, help with all the, our national situations. Now, enough about Clinton corn. Uh, our basic engineering design and drafting functions are located at Clinton and with a full complement of engineering disciplines, civil, architectural, piping, design, electrical, instrumentation, plant layout. The only thing that we don't do is make the nuts and bolts. We buy all our machinery, so uh, we let somebody else do that for us, but we put it all together. We have just recently installed a full-scale computer-aided drafting system. I don't know how many of you have been exposed to it. I know Brigham Young has one in their teaching facilities. I don't believe you here at Utah do. I hope soon you will because I think this is a thing that is really going. Um, I think in the next five years, that you will see the industry going so fast that you will see that at least 40 to 50 percent of the drafting functions will be done on some form of a computer-aided system. And I think it's up to the colleges to teach the technical people how to use these, to be familiar with them, at least, at least expose them to them because I think this is where the major market will be five years from now, is students and people that are trained in this manner. I'm going through the process right now of training my people. They had never seen one before. They had heard about it. I started two years ago talking to them about it, but they had never had exposure to it. And I drop in a machine right in their lap and they're going great guns. They have absolutely astounded me in their enthusiasm of working with this piece of equipment. It's just beautiful. They even work their lunch hours. And in this day and age, that is unusual. But that's the type of people that I have working with me, and that's the type of people that I try to hire, and those that aren't that type of people don't stay with me. Again, you've got to put it in there. You've got to be the person. When I was in Houston uh, two weeks ago, six students from the Texas A&M University presented the program for that evening at the professional council meeting. And believe me, they did a superb job. I was impressed with those six gentlemen. I don't know why they didn't have a girl worked in there, or they should have, but um, those, those six fellows really did a fantastic job. Two of them gave a talk on uh, photography and using photography and drafting and this sort of thing. Uh, and then two of them talked about a program that they had developed on their own computer drafting system for detailing structural steel. All the connections and this sort of thing. They put their program in. They wrote the parameters according to this, the American Steel Institute. And uh, all they had to do was put in five factors or five variables, and the machine would do the automatically figuring of it and everything, and then would actually draw the steel uh, connections and the beams and the whole nine yards. So you can see where we're going. Things are moving rapidly, and... Um, you're going to have to be on your toes to keep up with it, or you're going to be lost. You're going to find yourself in another profession. Um, now, I am serving as the national president of AIDD and was recently made an honorary member of the uh, Australian Institute of Design and Drafting. So AIDD is not only national, but international, because we do have one member on the board of directors is from Canada. And we have members in Hong Kong, Singapore, Hawaii, I guess that's in the United States, isn't it? And uh, uh, China, Australia, and uh, we're, we're picking, and we have a few members in, in England now. So um, 
we are a growing organization, and uh, we, we intend to continue to grow. Um, just, let's, let's just break for just a moment. And um, when I got to the airport to purchase my ticket here to Salt Lake, uh, I didn't have time, so I just took cash and went away. And uh, I was short a nickel change uh, for the fare to buy my ticket here. And, uh, and all I had was $50 bills that they'd brought me down from accounting. Uh, so I turned to the fellow behind me in line and asked him if he'd uh, give me a nickel to fly to Salt Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and this fellow behind me, he gave me a funny look, and he reached into his pocket, and he handed me a quarter, and he said, here, take four of your friends with you, too. <laughs> So, <laughs> you never know where you can go on a nickel. <laughs> and then, while I was on the plane, I noticed a priest and a rabbi were seated in front of me. And uh, so they struck up a conversation, and I was, it was a three-hour flight out here, and so they got into quite a conversation and so forth, and they got to talking about the different aspects of their religion. And one thing led to another, and, and uh, so the rabbi... Uh, the priest asked the rabbi if he'd ever eaten pork. And, uh, you know, that's a no-no in their religion. And uh, the rabbi said, uh, well, yes, he had tried it. So they talked a little more, and so then pretty soon, well, the, the rabbi asked the priest if he'd ever tried sex. And uh, that's a no-no in their respect. And uh, the priest said he really had to confess that he had. And after a few moments, the rabbi turned to the priest and he says, it's better than pork, isn't it? <laughs> now, <laughs> now that everybody is awake again, uh, let me talk just a few minutes about AIDD. AIDD is a nonprofit organization, as those of you who are members realize. How many are members in, in here? Are you all members? Okay. And um, involved in all aspects of the design drafting profession. So that whatever your future work involves, the preparation of drawings, the supervision of a drawing um, operation, or the education of design drafting students, AIDD has programs for each and every one of you that encompasses all of these areas. If you are now a student member of AIDD, I say to you after you graduate, maintain your AIDD membership so that you are aware of what is going on out there not only just in your own little cluster where you go to work. Keep informed of what's going on. AIDD was formed 17 years ago for the reason that there was not an organization devoted exclusively to our profession or that could adequately reflect the thinking of the thousands of men and women involved. And there are 350,000 today and we project that there will be 400,000 by the year 1980 involved in the profession of design and drafting. AIDD has ta undertaken the task of representing these people. We are growing, not just in numbers, but also in stature. The members we are attracting are men and women who are in established positions men and women who are dedicated to their work, men and women who are assisting in the programs that are developed by AIDD for advancing your profession. And I say that sincerely. It is your profession. And it's up to you to maintain the quality of your profession. If, do, do we have some something to drink here, or a glass of water, Carl. My, the, your humidity here is quite dry, and I'm not used to it. Okay? <laughs> With a little salt, please. Uh, <clears throat> now,
Now, what is AIDD doing, actually? To simplify the activities of AIDD, I have divided them into three categories. Programs, source of data, and participation. The programs of AIDD are programs are essentially edu all our programs are essentially educational in, the, in that that they are developed to be useful and beneficial to in, in the conduct of our business or education. Programs for members in industry include subjects along management lines as well as seminars and group discussions on new techniques. Computer-aided grafting is one of the fastest growing and all-encompassing revolutionary advantages to hit the design and drafting field since the invention of the T-square, and I believe that 100%. Programs for educators include curricular evaluation, certification, and student chapter activities, including our national drafting contest for students. And I brought along uh, the new announcement. We doubled the prize for first prize. So who in this room is going to win that first prize? I want to see one of you do it. OK. 150 bucks is not hard to take. That will buy about two beers, won't it? <laughs> two kegs of beer? Two kegs of beer, OK. AIDD conducts an annual seminar, convention, and exposition. We are planning and looking forward to our very, uh, planning and looking forward to a very successful 1977 convention uh, in Houston, Texas, the first week of April. A full range of design and drafting techniques and materials will be displayed, including, including at least two computer drafting systems. Uh, I hope we'll have four, but the two, the two additional ones have not signed their contracts yet, so I can only say that we know we will have two. All speakers have been selected for the seminar programs, and uh, the papers to be presented are such items as land surveying, modern piping, model design, computer drafting, and other ideas. Now, do you get into model design here in the, in the colleges? Have you gotten into that where you build models and so forth? In architectural? OK, very good. Now, is this architectural model, or have you gotten into process plant piping models and this sort of thing? Just architectural models. OK. <clears throat> now, I have brought along. We haven't mailed out the, uh, the, the uh, programs for the convention, but it will look something like this. This is the prospectus that went out to the, uh, uh, to the uh, exhibitors. And this, I don't, you can't see it from back there, but you can look at it later if you wish. It shows the, the dis, uh, display area and so forth. Um, I think it would be great if a few of you stu students could attend the national conference. Now, it costs money. So, um, thank you, Carl. That's big size. Well, I figured he was right. Is that German beer? Yes. I didn't know whether he told you or not, but I, I warned him when he got here that we had a dry climate. You're learning, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that a few of the students could attend the national conference. I think it would be quite an experience for you, get a, get a chance to rub elbows with 300 or more people from the industries uh, that will be attending the convention, and see, see how we really live out there. Uh, we've had uh, student chapters attending in the past have been from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Lane Tech at Chicago, which is a high school. It's a technical, uh, technical high school. And I visited, visited them, um, let's see, a year ago. 
and they really have a program going in the high school level. In fact, I would consider it to be comparable with the first year and maybe first and uh, first year first semester of the of the college level. They are that good at it, and they have one gal there was an architect for 30 years in her own office, and she retired, and the school board hired her to teach students, and she is one heck of a gal, and she really lays it on the line. You either put out or out you go. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. She was just tremendous. She really impressed me. She's 70 years old, and she doesn't act like a gal that's over 40. Just great. And I say to you that the challenge is yours to attend, to get together as a group. Maybe this is a project for you at, with your student chapters to raise money and send uh, an elected party uh, to the National Convention. So there's a, a food for thought for you to work on. Uh, I hope I'll be able to see some of your faces there. Uh, we'll have a good time and give you a good, uh, good run through for your money. Also, the American Institute for Design and Drafting envisions and promotes national campaigns to publicize the design and drafting profession, such as National Drafting Week. Last year, 27 state governors issued state proclamations acclaiming the first week of April as National Drafting Week. That's over 50 percent. This year, we hope to make it somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 75 percent. We also have a bill before Congress, after they get done with their fall to roll, their elections and all this, we'll find out who's who, who's on committees and so forth and so on. But our bill is in, we, we will resubmit it for national, federal reg, uh, recognition of National Drafting Week on a perpetual basis by the federal government the first week of April. So we are working on that program. And all this does to you is honor your profession as a designer and draftsman. Now, let me get on with the other part of uh, my talk. What is a draftsman or a designer? Uh, you can get a lot, of, a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts about this, but I would like to discuss three points or three facets of what I feel a draftsman or a designer is. I want to discuss your function, your training, and your responsibility. First of all, your function, as I simply stated, as a designer or draftsman, your function is to produce the hard copy graphical communication between the engineer and the scientist and the rest of the world. And it's just as simple as that. You are the drivetrain between the engineer and the world. The link between the input and the output. Without you, the wheels of the world would not exist let alone propel us to outer space. Now that's as simply as I can state it. How many agree with my uh, thinking on that? Now let's talk about your training. There is a great demand for good qualified draftsmen with technical or college training. Additional education after high school is preferred, and in many industries it is demanded. I see it happening more and more all the time. Today, most industries, to fill their drafting job openings, are employing only graduates who have received specialized training in design and drafting from technical institutes from junior colleges, vocational and correspondence schools. The specialized training including basic and uh, included basic and advanced training in mathematics, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, physics, chemistry, English, humanities, 
shop courses and courses in, in specific drafting fields such as architecture, aeronautics, automotive, electrical, electronics, illustrative, machine, mapping, piping, structural, sheet metal, the whole field. Also as a direct incentive to you, these industries will pay more for the qualified industrious person. I say to you, put every ounce of yourself into your training. Let it become a lifestyle habit. Remember those three words, a lifestyle habit. You will never regret it for the rest of your days. I have had many draftsmen come to me to work for me who couldn't spell shirt with the R left out. Get it all together. Now, for the ship only docks once. And you're at the dock right now. You're building... You're building your base for the rest of your life. Opportunities for advancement are favorable for well-trained, competent draftsmen. The rate of advancement will depend on you and largely on your initiative, your ability, and your willingness to continue to study and improve. And improve. Most companies today have further educational study programs where they reimburse you for your uh, tuition and cost of books and, and possibly other things associated. So there's no reason why you can't continue to further your education. But it takes initiative from you. It takes the energy from you. Nobody else can do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Advancements in drafting and design are awarded to those who earn them. And there's no other way. You can't polish the apple out there in the, in the world. You either produce or else. Prepare yourself for that day of your first interview for a job. Believe in yourself. The knowledge and the abilities you have acquired and have a clean, neat appearance. Now, when I mean that, I'm not adverse. I'm not from the old hard school. I'm not adverse to long hair, beards, and jeans, and this sort of thing. But if you don't have enough initiative to clean yourself up, put yourself together, then I, I, I don't particularly care want to consider you. So when you go out for that interview, have a clean, neat appearance. If a beard or that is your style, fine. That shows that you're an individual, and I want an individual. Never go to a job interview without a portfolio of your work. Now, all the work that you do here at the Institute or wherever you're at, keep your best things, make prints of them so that you can take them with you to show. Be prepared to show you are a trained draftsman. Nothing turns me off more than to have an applicant work, walk into my office, you know, and just come down and walk in the office, nothing there, and say, yeah, man, here I am. I'm a draftsman. My first reaction is, are you? Show me the proof. I want the proof that you can communicate through graphic documentation. Every design discipline has its own particular nuts and bolts. Learn the language and the details of your chosen discipline and learn it well. When Irving S. Cobb, excuse me for just a moment, hey, the dry weather's catching with me. This dark beer is good. <laughs> when Irving S. Cobb was 27 years old, he went to New York City with a wife and a sick child to support. He started to pound the city's pavements, going from one newspaper to an office to another, looking for work. For two weeks, he visited and revisited them, but the bosses always sent word 
that no help was needed. So as a last attempt, Cobb sent down and wrote a letter to each of the editors, wrote a letter proving that he could write effectively, proof that he was capable, that he had confidence in himself. And the letter ended as follows. This positively is your last chance. I have grown weary of studying the, the wallpaper designs in your anterooms. A modest appreciation of my own worth forbids me doing business with your head office boy any longer. Unless you grab me right away, I will go elsewhere and leave your paper flat on its back. And your whole life hereafter will be one vast surging regret. The line forms on the right. Applications considered in the order they're received. Write, call, or wire at the above address. The next day, Mr. Cobb was offered four jobs. So see what it takes. Believe in yourself, prove what you can do, and have confidence, and put your best foot forward. Now let's talk about your responsibility as designers and draftsmen. You, yes, each of you, have a responsibility to yourself, number one. You have a responsibility to your parents, your educators, and your community. Now maybe that sounds like old-fashioned, but that's the way it is, and that's the way the United States works, and that's the way the world works, and that's the way it's going to continue to work. Each one of us have those responsibilities, whether we believe it or not. Otherwise, we cannot be here as we are today, but we'll revert to the caveman theme. Yes, you have a responsibility to your future supervisor your future company, and the people who you will work with in your profession. The search for excellence should never retire from your minds and your actions. Every day of your life and my life is a new learning experience to broaden your skills and heighten your potentials for those that we and you serve. We serve not only our families, not only our future customers and companies, but we serve those who look to us for leadership. Let me expound on that just a little bit. You are now getting ready to, into the draft, learning the drafting profession or getting ready to graduate before too long, into the year or so. And the students back in the high school look to you already. So there are people looking to you already for leadership. It is your obligation to help those who work with us to fulfill their creative potential and to enhance their technical skills so that they may become designers and drafters. As, as I said before, get it all together now. You won't have another chance. It is you, the men and women of today, and people like you all over this great nation that are the backbone of today. We need each and every one of you and your counterpart in industry, in the educational field, and in the design and drafting rooms. Remember, you are today. Your children are tomorrow. Your actions and your deeds are your future. And I said all I have to say. We appreciate greatly your coming out. Thank you, Mark. And. Uh, Hope you enjoy your trip here and have a nice flight back. He said that he was sorry he didn't get get in into Salt Lake during the daytime so he could see the mountains and, 
and so I'm going to keep him over till Sunday afternoon when he leaves. You can see him on the way out. That sounds great. I I wrote down a couple of notes that may want to interchange between UTech Provo and BYU and our chapter here in Salt Lake. And that is, how about less getting on the ball and creating some inter-student chapter competition? In other words, uh, BYU, we've got a bigger chapter than you have. You see what I mean? Get get some kind of competition going, and, and some interchange. Not ne not necessarily bad competition, but some constructive competition. We can create together some industrial field chip trips for uh, different chapters to get involved in. Uh, our chapter has started an employee list. We've got a list of different employees in Salt Lake area, which is you know very handy when they graduate. We've got about 175 names. That's another thing to look forward. And the thing that turns me on the most now is this professional chapter that we're going to try to start this evening, trying to get relations, interrelations between or interchange from student chapter to professional chapter and graduation from the student chapter into the professional chapter so we can get feedback from the real world of work <laughs> as to what's really happening, uh, new trends, a couple of things that I've gotten feedback already. There are already two large companies in Salt Lake area that have Applicon computerized drafting units. Uh, not to mention any names, but they're Univac and IMCO. So that's a thing of the future, and we've got to start looking at it. And I think right here at UTech, we've got to look at it. Our sister institution, BYU, has already has an Applicon unit that they're putting in or have already implemented at their school. It's a thing of the that we've got to get oriented and moving on. Thanks again to Warren for coming out. We appreciate the time, effort, and the, the money and the what the less humid climate you come to. <laughs> and in behalf of the club, appreciate it. Now another thing I didn't get to do, and that was introduce the the chapter president. Chuck Rockwell, he, he was the opening speaker. Stand up, each one of you. Is. And Dave Turner is our vice president of student chapter. Dave. And Marla, secretary. Nelson, is it? Marla Nelson. Debbie Gordon, our treasurer. And there's one missing somewhere, isn't there? Jeff Dar. Oh, there he is, way back. Okay. Jeff Dar is our treasurer and strong-arm man and, and other incendiary things. Very good. Yes, balancer. We appreciate all of you coming, and we look forward to some meetings in the future. We're going to try to get some more industrial representatives maybe twice throughout the year, so that the rest of the year. We try to make at least three presentations, and we appreciate this. Any more comments from the audience? If not, let's, we're dismissed. Yes, any questions that you have towards uh, Wall Trip or about professional student chapter or any one of those problems, come forward. And, or if you want to floor them now, go ahead. Yes. Come on up, Warren. Answer. <clears throat> the question was, what what would he, what would he term putting your fe best foot forward be? It, that's a that's a big question because each of you have different capabilities. Okay, so I have to be close enough to you to realize or try to realize what I feel your potential is. Okay. My first uh, requisite of you is that you measure up to what I feel your potential is. You know, maybe I'm wrong. You know, this is a two-way street. Maybe you're better than I think you are. Okay, then show me. See? But each person that I hire and put in my drafting room, I have a feeling of what I think I, think I have a feeling or a judgment of what I feel they can do or what they're capable of doing. Now, some people are capable of doing more than others. I mean, that's the way the world is. But I always ask my people to perform to the best of their ability. 
And if they measure up to what I feel is their ability, then that's all I ask of them. But when they don't measure up to that ability, then that's when they're on the downhill street. I don't know whether I've answered your question or not, because to me it's a very complex question. I look at each person as an individual. I try to run my program that way, on a one-to-one -one basis. I mean, we're just not a mass or a mob. You've looked at pictures of where there's 25 rows this way and 25 rows this way, and all you see is heads and elbows and other, and uh, <laughs> I don't try to work it that way. I try to work with the individual. If you, if you feel that you have the potential to do what's asked of you, then never say no. Always do it. And do a little bit more. Always try to do the best job you can and try to do a little bit more than what's asked of you. Just as simple as that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else? I don't know. What, what, you have to relieve the room here at a certain time, or these students have to... Yeah, I, I think about the run of gamut. If you have individual questions, come forward, and we'll try to satisfy that. If you're interested in trying to interchange with the professional chapter, there's an 8 o'clock session in the same room tonight. And we've got approximately 150 professional draftsmen coming out tonight. Yeah, good place to look for a job, Chuck says. Get yourself exposed to it. <laughs> I knew there'd be a Not pleasure in the group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Did the photographer show while I was gone? I don't know. They probably do that. I hope I said what you want. You did a great job. Much better than I expected. Oh, come on. No, honestly, I can well, there's stuff shoot from the back east. But I you in person, so I you're coming out. When you're implementing computer science, would you like when you're getting people that are going to run it, would you rather have somebody that's already been trained in school to play it out there? Yes, because they'll say it cost me $2,000 per person. Well, yeah. But then you got to pay them one or two about the math. is Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas, but 100,000 Americans set off for California. They crossed the Great Plains and Rockies in covered wagons on horseback, and some even set out on foot, pushing wheelbarrows loaded with supplies. Others board ships in the east and sail around South America to reach San Francisco. A cartoon of the era even shows Americans joining the gold rush in balloons and imaginary rockets. Only a minority of 49ers ever strike it rich in the gold rush. For most, their dreams end in disappointment. In a few years, the gold has played out, but the impact of the gold rush is lasting. Although most of the far west is still an unsettled wilderness, California becomes a state in 1850 and extends the nation across the whole continent. There are other natural resources besides gold in America. In the 1840s, the sea provides the main source of oil for U.S. lamps and machinery. Over 700 whaling ships and 17,000 sailors are engaged in the great hunt for whales. Then in 1859, Edwin L. Drake gets the idea of drilling wells for oil after another man has gone broke trying to trap the oil as it oozes into pools and streams. Drake drills the first oil well in a farm in Titusville, Pennsylvania, striking oil 69 and a half feet down. Drilling booms in Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Ohio, and later in Texas, quickly follow Drake's discovery. At Oil Creek, Pennsylvania, John D. Rockefeller stands on a bank surveying his oil wells in 1864. Within a few years, oil makes Rockefeller one of the richest men in America. Oil will soon make possible automobiles, home furnaces, and the tremendous expansion of thousands of U.S. industries. The discovery of a new way to build houses in 1833 also has a far-reaching impact on American life. Previously, houses were built on a frame of massive heavy beams, the way barns are built. 
The new method involved building a framework of 2x4s and then nailing on the roof and siding. With handy-sized lumber and machine-made nails being cheaply mass-produced in the 1850s, a house can be knocked together in a matter of hours. As the West is settled, whole towns are built in a few weeks. The new dwellings are called balloon frame houses by doubters who predict that prairie winds will blow the houses up and away like balloons. But the balloon frame house proves even sturdier than the old style and is adopted everywhere, speeding up the settlement of the West, the growth of cities, and modern suburbs. The American genius for inventing things bursts forth in all directions during the mid-19th century. Before then, most farm work must be done by hand. With a scythe, the wheat farmer can only harvest about one acre a day. Then, in 1831, Cyrus Hall McCormick modernized his farming by inventing the mechanical reaper, which can harvest 10 acres a day. In 1848, it is being mass-produced, and the output of U.S. farms has vastly increased. In the 1850s, nearly two-thirds of American workers are engaged in farming, and farm life has its gay moments as well as its hard work. A spring picnic is a big event for a New England family. A husking bee makes the harvest into a community frolic as neighbors come from miles around to help out. There are also quilting bees, haying bees, apple-picking bees, cellar-digging bees, and even kissing bees. Country fairs are important events where farmers can see new breeds of livestock and new kinds of farm tools and machinery. City life has also changed by new inventions. In 1842, New Yorkers celebrate as the first public water system is turned on. The water gushing forth from the fountain is being piped into the city from the Croton River, 40 miles away. Public water is so popular that within eight years, 89 U.S. cities open public water systems. Before this, most city dwellers have their own wells or buy water for cooking and drinking from street vendors. Fire is a constant hazard of city life. Before its public water system is installed, New York must call on U.S. Marines and firefighters from as far off as New Haven and Philadelphia to battle this blaze in 1835. Public water also makes modern plumbing possible. But at first, only the rich can afford the luxury of bathrooms with running water and flush toilets. Inventors design all kinds of new bathroom devices, like the shower ring, placed over the head so that the bather can keep her hair dry. A revolution in American medicine oh. begins with the first use of ether as a painkiller in 1842. Oh. Before ether is used, surgeons must strap down screaming patients and rush through operations, and at least half their patients die of shock. The use of ether opens the way to modern surgical techniques. American eating habits are dramatically changed by new inventions, too. In 1856, a young man named Gail Borden discovers how to condense milk so that it will keep indefinitely making milk available anywhere, anytime. Borden's condensed milk is quickly followed by the modernization of canning. H.J. Hines sets women in his factory to work canning 57 varieties of preserved food. Products that were once seasonal or regional are now available to all. In a rapidly expanding nation, railroads are growing fast and tying the states together. In New Jersey, a steam train picks up passengers as they get off a steamboat. A European visitor is amazed at the way Americans like to travel. And he describes life in the U.S. in the late 1830s. The United States certainly presents the most animated picture of universal bustle and activity of any country in the world. Such a thing as rest does not even enter the mind of an American. In 1844, an inventor named Samuel Morse introduces another way of linking distant parts of the U.S., the telegraph. With money provided by Congress, Morse sets up a telegraph line from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. With a touch of humor, Morse taps out the first brief message, What hath God wrought? In 1856, Western Union is incorporated to create a national link-up. Telegraph lines soon crossed the whole continent, years before the railroads achieved the same feat. Photographs carry another kind of message throughout the nation. This photograph of Abraham Lincoln is taken when he is campaigning for president in 1860. It is reproduced nearly everywhere in the U.S., making Lincoln the first widely seen candidate for president. He runs for president hoping to preserve peace and keep the Union together. Lincoln warns the rebellious South. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. 
But Abraham Lincoln is destined to be a war president, presiding over the turbulent years of civil war in America. The rising conflict between North and South is both economic and political. Ever since the Missouri Compromise in the 1820s, Congress has bitterly debated whether new states should be slave or free. In the 1850s, anti-slavery and pro-slavery settlers fight many bloody battles. The U.S. Marines are called out to stop John Brown, the Kansas abolitionist, and his private army from freeing the slaves held captive in an old engine house at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. If Lincoln is elected, South Carolina will lead boldly for a Southern Confederacy, reads the bold type in this clothing ad from a South Carolina newspaper. Feelings like this run high throughout the South. When Lincoln is elected president in 1860, 11 Southern states break off from the Union and form the Confederate States of America. In April 1861, Lincoln makes the historic decision not to let the South go without a fight. In Washington, D.C., Union troops stage a massive parade as a divided nation prepares for war. Thirty years before the Civil War are growing years for America. The nation is in motion with families pushing west. Frontiersmen and prospectors exploring the wilderness in search of wealth and adventure. These are building years all over America, where strong arms and sharp axes clear the land for roads, farms, and villages. While many seek their fortunes in the west, others stay behind to cultivate the rich and abundant soil. Throughout the land, at work and sometimes at play, the American people turn to the task of building a young nation. Building years are also stormy years in the growing democracy. The plight of American slaves stirs increasing protest and conflict in the nation. Black people are often bought and sold on the auction block. A slave sold in New Orleans describes the auction. Many customers call the examiner. The owner make us hold up our heads, walk briskly back and forth, while customers would feel our hands and arms and body turn us about and ask us what we could do. Make us open our mouths and show our teeth, precisely as the jockey examines a horse which he is about to purchase. Many slaves escape from their owners, making their way to freedom in the North or in Canada. An Indiana farm serves as one stop in the Underground Railroad, the name given to the network of northerners who hide fugitive slaves and help them on their way. A black woman named Harriet Tubman makes countless secret trips into the south to lead more slaves northward. In the 200 years before the Civil War, slaves plot 250 revolts and conspiracies. The most famous is led by a Virginia slave named Nat Turner. Turner says his purpose is to strike terror and devastation everywhere, sparing neither women nor children. Turner and his followers kill 57 whites in two days. Six weeks later, Turner is finally caught and he is quickly tried and hanged. The many Indian nations are also without rights in the American democracy. In 1835, President Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy forces peaceful Indian families from their farms in Tennessee and Georgia. They are rounded up at gunpoint and marched to reservations on the plains of Oklahoma. Cherokees call the march the Trail of Tears, and nearly one of every four Indians dies of disease or exhaustion along the way. 
But for others in the nation, constructive changes are taking place as democracy is extended to the common man. The style of modern political campaigns emerges with the first two-party election for president in 1840. The Whig Party beats the Democrats and William Henry Harrison becomes president. He wins with a campaign promise of $2 a day and roast beef for everyone. In 1849, the discovery of gold in California sets off a westward rush of Americans in search of instant wealth. This miner's lump of gold is worth at least $1,500, at a time when many laborers back east earn only a dollar a day. California is half a continent away from the settled U.S. frontier, which extends west only as far as Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas. But 100,000 Americans set off for California. They crossed the Great Plains and Rockies in covered wagons on horseback, and some even set out on foot, pushing wheelbarrows loaded with supplies. Others board ships in the east and sail around South America to reach San Francisco. A cartoon of the era even shows Americans joining the gold rush in balloons and imaginary rockets. Only a minority of 49ers ever strike it rich in the gold rush. For most, their dreams end in disappointment. In a few years, the gold has played out, but the impact of the gold rush is lasting. Although most of the far west is still an unsettled wilderness, California becomes a state in 1850 and extends the nation across the whole continent. There are other natural resources besides gold in America. In the 1840s, the sea provides the main source of oil for U.S. lamps and machinery. Over 700 whaling ships and 17,000 sailors are engaged in the great hunt for whales. Then in 1859, Edwin L. Drake gets the idea of drilling wells for oil after another man has gone broke trying to trap the oil as it oozes into pools and streams. Drake drills the first oil well in a farm in Titusville, Pennsylvania, striking oil 69 and a half feet down. Drilling booms in Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Ohio, and later in Texas, quickly follow Drake's discovery. At Oil Creek, Pennsylvania, John D. Rockefeller stands on a bank surveying his oil wells in 1864. Within a few years, oil makes Rockefeller one of the richest men in America. Oil will soon make possible automobiles, home furnaces, and the tremendous expansion of thousands of U.S. industries. The discovery of a new way to build houses in 1833 also has a far-reaching impact on American life. Previously, houses were built on a frame of massive heavy beams, the way barns are built. The new method involves building a framework of two-by-fours and then nailing on the roof and siding. With handy-sized lumber and machine-made nails being cheaply mass-produced in the 1850s, a house can be knocked together in a matter of hours. As the West is settled, whole towns are built in a few weeks. The new dwellings are called balloon frame houses by doubters, who predict that prairie winds will blow the houses up and away like balloons. But the balloon frame house proves even sturdier than the old style and is adopted everywhere, speeding up the settlement of the West, the growth of cities, and modern suburbs. The American genius for inventing things bursts forth in all directions during the mid-19th century. Before then, most farm work must be done by hand. With a scythe, the wheat farmer can only harvest about one acre a day. Then, in 1831, Cyrus Hall McCormick modernizes farming by inventing the mechanical reaper, which can harvest 10 acres a day. In 1848, it is being mass-produced, and the output of U.S. farms is vastly increased. In the 1850s, nearly two-thirds of American workers are engaged in farming, and farm life has its gay moments as well as its hard work. A spring picnic is a big event for a New England family. A husking bee makes the harvest into a community frolic as neighbors come from miles around to help out. There are also quilting bees, haying bees, apple-picking bees, cellar-digging bees, and even kissing bees. Country fairs are important events where farmers can see new breeds of livestock and new kinds of farm tools and machinery. City life has also changed by new inventions. In 1842, New Yorkers celebrate as the first public water system is turned on. The water gushing forth from the fountain is being piped into the city from the Croton River 40 miles away. Public water is so popular that within eight years, 89 U.S. cities open public water systems. Before this, most city dwellers have their own wells or buy water for cooking and drinking from street vendors. Fire is a constant hazard of city life. Before its public water system is installed, New York must call on U.S. Marines and firefighters from as far off as New Haven and Philadelphia to battle displays in 1835. Public water also makes modern plumbing possible. 
but at first only the rich can afford the luxury of bathrooms with running water and flush toilets. Inventors design all kinds of new bathroom devices, like the shower ring placed over the head so that the bather can keep her hair dry. A revolution in American medicine begins with the first use of ether as a painkiller in 1842. Before ether is used, surgeons must strap down screaming patients and rush through operations, and at least half their patients die of shock. The use of ether opens the way to modern surgical techniques. American eating habits are dramatically changed by new inventions too. In 1856, a young man named Gail Borden discovers how to condense milk so that it will keep indefinitely making milk available anywhere, anytime. Borden's condensed milk is quickly followed by the modernization of canning. H.J. Hines sets women in his factory to work canning 57 varieties of preserved food. Products that were once seasonal or regional are now available to all. In a rapidly expanding nation, railroads are growing fast and tying the states together. In New Jersey, a steam train picks up passengers as they get off a steamboat. A European visitor is amazed at the way Americans like to travel and he describes life in the U.S. in the late 1830s. The United States certainly presents the most animated picture of universal bustle and activity of any country in the world. Such a thing as rest does not even enter the mind of an American. In 1844, an inventor named Samuel Morse introduces another way of linking distant parts of the U.S., the telegraph. With money provided by Congress, Morse sets up a telegraph line from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. With a touch of humor, Morse taps out the first brief message. What hath God wrought? In 1856, Western Union is incorporated to create a national link-up. Telegraph lines soon crossed the whole continent, years before the railroads achieved the same feat. Photographs carry another kind of message throughout the nation. This photograph of Abraham Lincoln is taken when he is campaigning for president in 1860. It is reproduced nearly everywhere in the U.S., making Lincoln the first widely seen candidate for president. He runs for president, hoping to preserve peace and keep the Union together. Lincoln warns the rebellious South. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. But Abraham Lincoln is destined to be a war president, presiding over the turbulent years of civil war in America. The rising conflict between North and South is both economic and political. Ever since the Missouri Compromise in the 1820s, Congress has bitterly debated whether new states should be slave or free. In the 1850s, anti-slavery and pro-slavery settlers fight many bloody battles. The U.S. Marines are called out to stop John Brown, the Kansas abolitionist, and his private army from freeing the slaves held captive in an old engine house at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. If Lincoln is elected, South Carolina will lead boldly for a Southern Confederacy, reads the bold type in this clothing ad from a South Carolina newspaper. Feelings like this run high throughout the South. When Lincoln is elected president in 1860, 11 Southern states break off from the Union and form the Confederate States of America. In April 1861, Lincoln makes the historic decision not to let the South go without a fight. In Washington, D.C., Union troops stage a massive parade as a divided nation prepares for war. Thirty years before the Civil War are growing years for America. The nation is in motion with families pushing west. Frontiersmen and prospectors exploring the wilderness in search of wealth and adventure. These are building years all over America, where strong arms and sharp axes clear the land for roads, farms, and villages. While many seek their fortunes in the west, others stay behind to cultivate the rich and abundant soil. Throughout the land, at work and sometimes at play, the American people turn to the task of building a young nation.
These building years are also stormy years in the growing democracy. The plight of American slaves stirs increasing protest and conflict in the nation. Black people are often bought and sold on the auction block. A slave sold in New Orleans describes the auction. Many customers called the examiner. The owners make us hold up our heads, walk briskly back and forth, while customers would feel our hands and arms and body turn us about and ask us what we could do. Make us open our mouths and show our teeth, precisely as the jockey examines a horse which he is about to purchase. Many slaves escape from their owners, making their way to freedom in the North or in Canada. An Indiana farm serves as one stop in the Underground Railroad, the name given to the network of Northerners who hide fugitive slaves and help them on their way. A black woman named Harriet Tubman makes countless secret trips into the South to lead more slaves northward. In the 200 years before the Civil War, slaves plot 250 revolts and conspiracies. The most famous is led by a Virginia slave named Matt Turner. Turner says his purpose is to strike terror and devastation everywhere, sparing neither women nor children. Turner and his followers kill 57 whites in two days. Six weeks later, Turner is finally caught and he is quickly tried and hanged. The many Indian nations are also without rights in the American democracy. In 1835, President Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy forces peaceful Indian families from their farms in Tennessee and Georgia. They are rounded up at gunpoint and marched to reservations on the plains of Oklahoma. Cherokees call the march the Trail of Tears, and nearly one of every four Indians dies of disease or exhaustion along the way. But for others in the nation, constructive changes are taking place as democracy is extended to the common man. The style of modern political campaigns emerges with the first two-party election for president in 1840. The Whig Party beats the Democrats and William Henry Harrison becomes president. He wins with a campaign promise of $2 a day and roast beef for everyone. In 1849, the discovery of gold in California sets off a westward rush of Americans in search of instant wealth. This miner's lump of gold is worth at least $1,500 at a time when many laborers back east earn only a dollar a day. California is half a continent away from the settled U.S. frontier, which extends west only as far as Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas. But 100,000 Americans set off for California. They crossed the Great Plains and Rockies in covered wagons on horseback, and some even set out on foot, pushing wheelbarrows loaded with supplies. Others board ships in the east and sail around South America to reach San Francisco. A cartoon of the era even shows Americans joining the gold rush in balloons and imaginary rockets. Only a minority of 49ers ever strike it rich in the gold rush. For most, their dreams end in disappointment. In a few years, the gold has played out, but the impact of the gold rush is lasting. Although most of the far west is still an unsettled wilderness, California becomes a state in 1850 and extends the nation across the whole continent. There are other natural resources besides gold in America. In the 1840s, the sea provides the main source of oil for U.S. lamps and machinery. Over 700 whaling ships and 17,000 sailors are engaged in the great hunt for whales. Then in 1859, Edwin L. Drake gets the idea of drilling wells for oil after another man has gone broke trying to trap the oil as it oozes into pools and streams. Drake drills the first oil well in a farm in Titusville, Pennsylvania, striking oil 69 and a half feet down. Drilling booms in Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Ohio, and later in Texas, quickly follow Drake's discovery. At Oil Creek, Pennsylvania, John D. Rockefeller stands on a bank surveying his oil wells in 1864. Within a few years, oil makes Rockefeller one of the richest men in America. Oil will soon make possible automobiles, home furnaces, and the tremendous expansion of thousands of U.S. industries. The discovery of a new way to build houses in 1833 also has a far-reaching impact on American life. 
Previously, houses were built on a frame of massive heavy beams, the way barns are built. The new method involves building a framework of two-by-fours and then nailing on the roof and siding. With handy-sized lumber and machine-made nails being cheaply mass-produced in the 1850s, a house can be knocked together in a matter of hours. As the West is settled, whole towns are built in a few weeks. The new dwellings are called balloon frame houses by doubters who predict that prairie winds will blow the houses up and away like balloons. But the balloon frame house proves even sturdier than the old style and is adopted everywhere, speeding up the settlement of the West, the growth of cities, and modern suburbs. The American genius for inventing things bursts forth in all directions during the mid-19th century. Before then, most farm work must be done by hand. With a scythe, the wheat farmer can only harvest about one acre a day. Then, in 1831, Cyrus Hall McCormick modernized his farming by inventing the mechanical reaper, which can harvest 10 acres a day. In 1848, it is being mass-produced, and the output of U.S. farms has vastly increased. In the 1850s, nearly two-thirds of American workers are engaged in farming, and farm life has its gay moments as well as its hard work. A spring picnic is a big event for a New England family. A husking bee makes the harvest into a community frolic as neighbors come from miles around to help out. There are also quilting bees, haying bees, apple picking bees, cellar digging bees, and even kissing bees. Country fairs are important events where farmers can see new breeds of livestock and new kinds of farm tools and machinery. City life has also changed by new inventions. In 1842, New Yorkers celebrate as the first public water system is turned on. The water gushing forth from the fountain is being piped into the city from the Croton River 40 miles away. Public water is so popular that within eight years, 89 U.S. cities open public water systems. Before this, most city dwellers have their own wells or buy water for cooking and drinking from street vendors. Fire is a constant hazard of city life. Before its public water system is installed, New York must call on U.S. Marines and firefighters from as far off as New Haven and Philadelphia to battle displays in 1835. Public water also makes modern plumbing possible. But at first, only the rich can afford the luxury of bathrooms with running water and flush toilets. Inventors design all kinds of new bathroom devices, like the shower ring, placed over the head so that the bather can keep her hair dry. A revolution in American medicine begins with the first use of ether as a painkiller in 1842. Before ether is used, Surgeons must strap down screaming patients and rush through operations, and at least half their patients die of shock. The use of ether opens the way to modern surgical techniques. American eating habits are dramatically changed by new inventions, too. In 1856, a young man named Gail Borden discovers how to condense milk so that it will keep indefinitely making milk available anywhere, anytime. Borden's condensed milk is quickly followed by the modernization of canning, H.J. Hines sets women in his factory to work canning 57 varieties of preserved food. Products that were once seasonal or regional are now available to all. In a rapidly expanding nation, railroads are growing fast and tying the states together. In New Jersey, a steam train picks up passengers as they get off a steamboat. A European visitor is amazed at the way Americans like to travel and he describes life in the U.S. in the late 1830s. The United States certainly presents the most animated picture of universal bustle and activity of any country in the world. Such a thing as rest does not even enter the mind of an American. In 1844, an inventor named Samuel Morse introduces another way of linking distant parts of the U.S., the telegraph. With money provided by Congress, Morse sets up a telegraph line from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. With a touch of humor, Morse taps out the first brief message. What hath God wrought? In 1856, Western Union is incorporated to create a national link-up. Telegraph lines soon crossed the whole continent, years before the railroads achieved the same feat. Photographs carry another kind of message throughout the nation. This photograph of Abraham Lincoln is taken when he is campaigning for president in 1860. It is reproduced nearly everywhere in the U.S., making Lincoln the first widely seen candidate for president. He runs for president, hoping to preserve peace and keep the Union together. Lincoln warns the rebellious South. A house divided against itself cannot stand. 
I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. But Abraham Lincoln is destined to be a war president, presiding over the turbulent years of civil war in America. The rising conflict between North and South is both economic and political. Ever since the Missouri Compromise in the 1820s, Congress has bitterly debated whether new states should be slave or free. In the 1850s, anti-slavery and pro-slavery settlers fight many bloody battles. The U.S. Marines are called out to stop John Brown, the Kansas abolitionist, and his private army from freeing the slaves held captive in an old engine house at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. If Lincoln is elected, South Carolina will lead boldly for a Southern Confederacy, reads the bold type in this clothing ad from a South Carolina newspaper. Feelings like this run high throughout the South. When Lincoln is elected president in 1860, 11 Southern states break off from the Union and form the Confederate States of America. In April 1861, Lincoln makes the historic decision not to let the South go without a fight. In Washington, D.C., Union troops stage a massive parade as a divided nation prepares for war. 